Good evening. I think I'll get started here. I'm talking to the back of heads, but only momentarily. I'll be moving up front in a moment, but we'll just get through some of the business here. Um, I'd like to call to order the City Council meeting of Tuesday, November 27th, 2018. This is a special meeting. And please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call, please. Okay. Albertson? Here. Bueller? Here. Danforth? Here. Lalum? Here. Manti? Absent? Roby? Here. Solom? Here. Thorson? Absent? Billhauer? Here. And why? Present. Thank you. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is the public comment period, and this is the time for people to come forward if they have something they want to talk about that is not on the agenda. You can do that here. Is there anyone that wants to do that? See, none will move on. The second item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion and second for approval? So moved. Moved by Vilhauer, second by Lalum. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. And the third item on the agenda is the tax presentation. So I'd like to invite Councilman Don Roby and Finance Officer Kristen Bobzine to join me up front. I would like to thank everyone for coming. This is such a great turnout. And that tells me this is an engaged community. When people come out of their warm, cozy homes on a cold winter night to come watch a presentation about taxes, <laughs> that's remarkable. So thank you for being here. And I also would like to thank Councilman Don Roby. This was his idea. And I think it's a great idea just to give the public an opportunity to hear about how we collect our taxes and so on, what we do with them. This is an informational meeting and um, it was a great plan, I think, to do this. I'd like to do this periodically too with different topics. And also Kristen Bobsey and the finance officer, Kristen and Don did a lot of work to put all the details together and the three of us will be jointly making this presentation. I'd also like to thank the assistant finance officer, Christine Crom. she did a lot of work too to put this together. So. Thanks everyone for coming. And hmm? oh, I'll get a turn on. Someone's saving power by turning the clicker off. <laughs> Good thing. So the agenda tonight, the first thing is the objective, which as I said, is just to give the public an idea of what we're doing. Transparency is a very important thing to all of us here. And we want you to know that your elected officials, the mayor and the council and the city staff are all working to the betterment of the community. And so this is just to give you an opportunity to see that and ask questions if you have them. The health of our city is obviously of, of a very high priority for us. So we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about the first, second and third penny sales taxes. We'll be talking about sales tax history. We'll be talking about property tax a little bit. And we'll be talking about our funds, the general fund, the capital improvement fund, and the bed, board, and booze, or BBB fund. We'll also talk a little bit about our budget considerations. And the health of the city is just intimately tied with sales tax revenue. And actually, the sales tax revenue both is the cause and the result of it. So let me explain that a little bit. If you have an economically healthy community, people are developing, they're spending their money, that money is coming back into the economy, comes back into our coffers so we can offer a higher level of service and we can offer more amenities. And that causes people to spend more money. So it's an upward spiral. 
that can also be a downward spiral. So you need to pay attention to that. We in Watertown are very fortunate that we have an economically sound community. I don't want anyone to get the idea that we're doing this presentation to unveil some bad news about our economic health. We are very economically healthy in Watertown. And that's due to the efforts and planning and strategy that goes back many, many, many years. The setup that we have here is remarkable. We have strong fund balances. We have a healthy amount of debt, but we are nowhere near our capacity for accruing debt in this community. We have legal limits that, that we have to comply with, but we're not anywhere near that. And we've been budgeting conservatively for many, many years. So today's presentation, we're going to be talking about these things, sales tax revenue, property taxes, general fund, capital improvement fund, and the BBB fund. What we are not going to be talking about are the enterprise funds, which are the funds where we keep the money we get for the services that we provide, like the sewer, solid waste, electric, water, gas, and airport. Uh, we're also not going to be talking about our special revenue funds. That's for a different day. And we aren't talking about any s one specific project. That's not our intention. We're also not going to be talking about making changes to the way we're doing things. Tonight is devoted just for information about how we do things now. And hopefully it'll lay the groundwork for future conversations when we do talk about making changes if we want. So, oops, I will hand it over to Don. Can anybody hear this okay? All right, thank you, Mayor. If you look at Watertown as a business, we're about a $40 million a year enterprise. And tonight, as Sarah said, what we are, gonna, are and are not gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about half of that business, and that involves mainly our sales tax revenue, a little bit about property taxes, then the funds, that the, uh, the, I should say the funds that get fed by those taxes. As you may or may not know, we have three pennies of sales tax in Watertown. When I ran for council five years ago, I put together a presentation which I found a lot of people really didn't want to listen to when you're running for office. But I did give that presentation three times. And what I found was a lot of people were like me. They, they kind of knew what we had for taxes. I kind of got it. I kind of didn't. They weren't quite sure. And that was kind of the impetus of really wanting to get into some of this. So we hope you ask uh, a lot of questions. We're going to take I have questions at the end. But if something pops up in the middle, we'll be glad to address that question on the spot. So we have three pennies of tax here in Watertown. The first and second penny are subject to anything that's taxed by the state of South Dakota. So pretty much all merchandise, groceries, activities and services are charged the first and second penny. The third penny has more to do with lodging and dining. If you're going out on the town, you'll pay that third penny of tax. So those are the three. We're going to break those apart individually. But just to give you a snapshot in totality of what happens when we do tax, if you go downtown and buy some merchandise, you're about to buy a new shirt or new pair of shoes, you're going to pay the 4.5% state tax. That used to be 4%, if you remember, but we had an election or an event that went to the, the vote of the people, and we voted a half a cent raise in that tax for the teacher fund. We, then we have our first penny, our second penny, our third penny. There's also a tourism tax out there. But if you buy something downtown, you're going to see those first three taxes come into play. So if you look at your receipt next time you're downtown or out uh, one of the stores shopping locally, you're going to see a 6.5% tax on that purchase. If you go out and have dinner, you're going to see that same 6.5%, except you're going to have that third penny, which is the infamous bed, booze, and board tax. We all hear about the BBB tax. If you're going to have a drink or if you're going to go out to dinner, you'll get charged that extra penny, so your taxes on that purchase are going to be about 7.5%. And then lastly, the last example is if you're going to go out to an event. Uh, you know, tourism is the second largest industry in South Dakota, be only behind agriculture. And the state bills out about over $2 billion we get for sales taxes. One of the taxes they have in addition to the standard four and a half is that tourism tax. So for instance, if you go to the zoo in Watertown, you're going to pay the state tax of four and a half, all three pennies of city tax. And in addition for that admission, there's another percent and a half for the state tourism tax. So that's kind of the full picture. Let's break those apart 
one by one and look at some of the history of those three pennies. So, quick review. Anything subject to the sales tax, most merchandise purchases are going to get that first penny. If you look at a 15-year period, and we broke this out back to 2003, broke it into three segments. If you look at our years on the bottom, we go up a million dollars at a time here. What you're going to see is the growth of the first penny. And in the blue, from 2003 to 2006, we, that fund grew, or that tax receipts grew at about 4.8% on average for that five-year period. The green bars in the middle, that grew from 2008 to 2012 at 3.12%, and from 2013 to 2017, it grew to 1.76%. So we expect some volatility in sales taxes because we can't con necessarily control that. We can do things to try and enhance it and get more sales tax revenue, but but we're kind of at the mercy of what's going on in the economy a little bit. The only thing I would point out there is that growth rate is decreasing. Now, that's not a fire alarm. That's not a red flag. It's more of kind of a light pastel yellow flag. Our growth rates, we're still growing that tax, but it's growing at a slower rate. Sales taxes are cyclical. You can expect them to go up and go down. But obviously, we want to watch that trend. We want that trend going up. So the, the most recent trend is it's growing just not as much as we like. For budgetary purposes, what we do downtown is we usually look at about 2% a year growth in our sales tax. So that's just a little bit below what we typically would budget at. Now the second penny, again, subject to the same things as the first penny. Those two pennies mirror each other, except if you go back in history. So starting about 2009, they started mirroring each other. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy in the two charts. I want to point that out. But about 2009, they did mirror those up, and that's the way it will be going for the foreseeable future. But we have the same data here. Million dollars at a time going up, 6.9% in the blue, 3.31% in the green, and, and that matches between 13 and 17 at 1.76%. So again, second penny now mirrors the first penny, still going up, just not as much as we'd like it to. Don, if I can ask a question. Yeah. When you said that started mirroring, did we go from 1.5% to 2%? Was, that, was there an increase? Okay. And there were some other things the way they accounted for that back, you know, 10 years ago a little bit differently. They didn't tax it always as evenly as we do now. Good. All right. So the third penny, again, lodging, dining, entertainment type things. Our scale has changed here. Our scale isn't at a million dollars a tick now. It's up at $100,000 a tick. But same analysis. 2003 to 2007, it grew at 7.1%. That's pretty healthy. That's a good-looking chart in the blue. Times were pretty good back then. You look at 2008 to 2012, it's growing at 1.77%, so a little bit of a dip. But in the last five-year period, that's about 4.78%. Our BBB tax, actually, this year, we're gonna, we finished about 880000 last year. We're going to exceed that this year. We'll get over $900,000 this year. And I will say, there's some neat things going on in town. We've got, I think, a little better coordination going on with some of our organizations. CVB is doing some really neat things behind the scenes, a lot of data-driven decisions. So we hope to see that improve, and we're confident that it will. So this chart combines all three. When you combine all three, you see a little more volatility, volatility going up and down. But again, what I'm going to point out is we're still growing. In this case, when you put all three together, it's at 1.91% the last five years. That's okay. We'd like to see it more, but the trend is it's decreasing. So again, we're not panicked about that, but it is a trend we want to be aware of, and we're certainly paying attention to. So... When you look back to what I, the example I gave earlier, how your taxes are purchased, there's, th there's three pennies. You can see how they're laid out. You can see how the state taxes come in. But these three pennies do drive uh, three of our major funds that we work with, which Kristen's going to talk about here in a minute. We do want to talk a little bit about property taxes. I think property taxes are misunderstood. Um, we do get revenue from property taxes on city properties. And here's kind of a general breakdown. The school, actually, when they levy their taxes on property, they take about 58% of the total tax in Watertown. And again, this is just city, not county. 
If you look at the county, they get 24% of that because the city, of course, is part of Coddington County. You look at that blue piece of the chart, the blue piece of pie over there, that's about 19%. So the city does get revenue from property taxes. It was about $3.3 million last year. Now you contrast that to how much we got into the first, second, and third penny. So this is 3.34 million. We got about 15.2, 15.3 last year from our three penny sales tax. So it's significant, not as significant as our sales tax revenue, but nonetheless, it does add to the coffers. This is an interesting chart. If you look at the Class A cities throughout South Dakota, with the exception of Brookings, which just snips us out, we have extremely competitive property tax rates. I have at the bottom listed the mill levy and how they, they do tax those, and Brookings just beats us. But as you can see, other cities that we compare ourselves against, they're charging quite a bit in terms of mill levies for property taxes. I don't think that's very well understood in Watertown. I mean, nobody likes to pay taxes, but in terms of what we pay compared to others, that's pretty competitive. And one reason that is, is we have good sales tax revenue. As long as we have a healthy sales tax revenue, we don't have to go back and look for ways to increase our property taxes. And by the way, the state really dictates that. We can only do so much in raising property taxes that's covered by the state. If, an example, a community wants to go outside that, then they do what's called an opt-out. And you've probably heard that phrase before. The city of Sioux Falls just did a big opt-out to finance some of their new high schools they want to build. And we have not done that here. So we have a very competitive property tax situation. It does play into and, and it does fund a lot of our doings in the city. So property taxes, as you would expect, property tends to be pretty stable. It's a lot more stable than would be, again, our sales tax revenue. So if you look at the last 15 years and you can see the corresponding growth rates, it's pretty steady. Now, you can look at that and say, gee, my taxes keep going up. Well, they do go up a little bit most years, but really what affects that change the most is we're adding new properties to the tax roll. So when somebody builds a new house or we add a new business or build a new uh, building, our property tax base increases, therefore we're going to collect more property taxes. But that's a pretty good story for us. It's, it does generate revenue that helps operate the city, uh, but uh, it's very competitive throughout the state. Um, I wanted to make a point on compound interest. It's, it's kind of a simple concept, but uh, compound interest has been described as the most powerful force in the universe. That's accredited to Albert Einstein, and I've researched that, and I'm not sure that's exactly right. There, there, there's questions about that. But when you talk about compound interest, you think about when you're doing a savings account, and you're putting money in the bank, if you're getting a CD, what have you. Every year, you're getting interest on your interest. In other words, it's compounding. So in a very simple example, if I have $100 at 5%, at the end of year one, I have $105. But I start beginning of year two, I start with 105. I don't go back to 100. I compound and again get interest on my interest. So I wanted to make that concept at least part of the conversation because if you look at that from an expense standpoint, then it kind of makes you think a little bit because really what's happening in some cases is we're having some of our expenses compound each year. We can't compound our sales tax revenue. It goes up, it goes down, but there are certain expenses that never go down. Healthcare costs, personnel costs, those things tend to go up. So compound interest is something that's your friend if it's revenue coming in. It's not your friend if it's expenses going out. And I wanted to give you an example of what happens when we have a negative year. So I got a lot of, a lot of things on this chart, so bear with me. This example, I've got four years going across the bottom. I'm going to use an example of $100. So it's dollars in increments of 10 going uh, south to north. If I start out year one with $100, and I increase that at 10% a year, I end up going to 110, 121, 133. So I'm compounding my growth because, again, I'm getting interest on my interest. Flip that over if, you're, if that's a tax if it's the first penny sales tax. If it's going up every year, it works great, but what happens if you have a down year? So for this example, I again in the yellow start out at $100, but let's say it goes down 10%. Now I'm down to $90, and then I pick back up my 10% a year growth from that point forward. 
you'll never catch up. And not only will you not catch up, they'll actually grow apart because you're compounding on a smaller number. So when you have a down year, you can't just keep growing at the expected rate. You've got to make up for it either the next year or in several subsequent years. The third example I'm going to show you, same starting point in the green. It's $100. It goes down to 90 the first year. If I want to catch back up in that first year after my down year, I have to get a return of 34%. I have to more than triple my return. So again, back to these two years, I'm down to 90. To get back up to 121 and get back on course, I've got to have an increase of like 34%. That's a big number. If you put that in the context of a sales tax, our first penny, we typically grow about 2% a year. If we lose 2% on a particular year, we have to get about 6.2% growth the following year just to get back on track. And again, that's a simple but important concept because, again, we've got a lot of our expenses are compounding over time, and we don't always get the advantage of compounding when your revenue is going up and down. So in this instance, the point is when we have down years, it's cyclical. We expect to have them from time to time. But keep in mind, we've really got to do a lot of work to maintain and get back up to where we need to be. So our challenge, our city taxes, our revenues are unpredictable. We can guess, we can forecast. Again, we typically forecast about 2% growth a year on the first, second, and third penny. But some of our city expenses are compounding. So we're in really good financial shape. And I want to reiterate that. The mayor made that point earlier. We're in good financial shape. But if you watch any of our budget meetings, which I'm sure all of you saw every one of those meetings last time, we had some talk about maybe just being cautious a little bit. Not because we're in trouble, but because we don't ever want to get in trouble. When you look at municipalities that have gotten in trouble, last time I saw the statistics, since 2010, 61 municipalities across the country have gone bankrupt. So a city, a county, it went bankrupt. That happened because they weren't looking down the road. When they start seeing trends that, working, that were working against them, they didn't worry about it. They just looked right what's in front of them, addressed the problems today. Let's not worry about the future. And we've never done that in Watertown. We've had a pretty good track record of being conservative in how we budget. We're trying to look out to the point where so in 10 or 15 years, it doesn't become a problem. Yep. Uh, I'd just like to interject, uh, just to put a couple numbers to it. Our, I want to talk about our general fund for just a minute, and I apologize for interrupting here, but I thought it might be a good point. Our general fund at the end of 2017 was like our unobligated general fund balance, like $7.2 million, something like that. Our 2019 budgeted general fund expenditures, roughly $19 million. You do the math on that, what that means is we've got about five months' worth of general fund expenditures sitting in our general fund. Now, are we going to, is that all going to disappear overnight? No. But Don, to Don's point, if we don't, if we don't look, look ahead and plan for, th for p potential downturns, that general fund can disappear in a hurry without even us realizing what's going on. And we do have fund reserves. Kristen's going to address some of that. Because if you look at your taxes, not every year do we get enough taxes to cover all expenses. So when we have expenses greater than our revenues, we'll go into reserves to cover that difference. But there's also years where we have revenues that are greater expenses, and then that feeds into the reserves for the next time the rain, the, the rain decides to come. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. I've talked about where the pennies come from. She's going to talk about the, where the pennies go to. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have just went over, as Councilman Roby said, um, how we get our money. And now we're going to talk about where it goes. So the first penny of our sales tax and the property tax are all placed into our general fund. The second penny tax goes into the capital improvement fund. And the third penny is placed into the BBB fund. So when we look at the general fund, I always like to think of our general fund as basically our operating fund. That is the fund that houses our public safety, our public works, um, our administration, that's our engineering, our finance, attorney, those are those items. So when we look at the general fund, think operating. It's the running of the city. When we look at the revenue side of the general fund, the first penny sales tax on average is putting about 46% of the revenue into that fund. 
The property tax on average is around the 20% that goes in for revenue and our transfers in are around 11%. Um, the other sources, there's lots of different things that kind of can fluctuate between grants and charges for services, which is the ambulance. Um, when we flip and we look at the expenditure side, the personnel services, that's our wages and benefits to our employees. There again, a lot of the personnel services are the public safety, that's for your police, your fire, um, the street, the snow removal, stuff like that. When you think of your operating expenditures, that's where, again, you want to think of that day-to-day -day running of the city. That's going to be the different utilities. That's the fuel. That's the supplies for the many different departments that, house, um, that are housed in the general fund. The capital equipment expenditures, those are some, a couple big ones that you can think of when you think of that is the street equipment. Um, we got the motor graders, the loaders. And then the general fund also does help out the park and rec and the airport on some of their day-to-day -day operations. In 2018, $1.7 million was transferred out of the general fund to the park and rec funds. The next fund that we'll talk about is the capital improvement fund. When you think of the capital improvement fund, think of the infrastructure improvements throughout the city. Think of those big things, you're building roads, you're um, building new buildings, remodeling some of the other ones we have. So that's what the capital improvement fund is. The capital improvement fund has some restrictions. It is actually restricted by city ordinance for what can be spent out of the capital improvement fund. On the revenue side, the capital improvement fund, you can see 84% on average of the revenue that goes in there is from sales tax. So it relies heavily on sales tax revenue. When we flip to the expenditure side, there again, like I said, the capital improvement fund is the one where when we build new roads, when we redo our roads, um, this is the one that we, we look to for this. It also can, by ordinance, pay for our ambulance and our fire trucks. Um, the other thing that I wanna touch on is the debt service. We all know when we do our sales tax revenue bonds, we then have to pay them back. So with that, currently in 2017, about 40% of the total expenditures from the capital improvement fund were used to pay for the debt. So that's just kind of a, a number to keep in mind. Um, I do wanna reiterate the point that the city does not use its capital improvement dollars for operating expenditures. As I said, the capital improvement dollars are restricted by city ordinance for only capital expenditures, the infrastructure, fire trucks, ambulance, uh, contribution to E911 and debt. So, and the last one we'll talk about is our BBB fund. Our BBB fund, when you think of that, you wanna think of your advertising and promotion of the city, your recreation. That's what the BBB fund was for. As you can see from this, um, that is pretty much all that goes into the BBB fund is the third penny of our sales tax. 95% of the revenue in there is from our third penny sales tax. On the expenditure side, the BBB fund helps to support the Watertown Event Center. It helps to support the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Watertown Chamber. There again, those help us in our advertising and promotion. Um, we wanna promote the city of Watertown and bring in the recreation. So with that, I think it's back to Councilman Roby. I get to do all the graphs, so. So, quick review. The general fund, day-to-day -day operations. We open the doors, we close the doors, we pay our employees. The capital improvement fund, we're building the city. It's our infrastructure. The BBB fund, entertainment, dining, eating, et cetera. So let's look at just the revenue side of those three funds. Our graph here again is 15 years along the bottom. We go up to 30 million on top and five $5 million increments. So those three funds combined, again, just to look at the average growth, that first five year period, 03 to 07, it was 9.38%. If you remember from our past charts, though that was a good period. Economy was working pretty well at that time. You look at 08 to 2012, it's still growing over 5%. If you look at 2013 to 2017, we actually grew at a slightly negative percent. So if you look at the chart, where we're at in 17, it is slightly below where we were in 2012. Now, 
these things are cyclical. So again, we're in good health. The city's doing very well, but that has certainly caught our attention. I referenced earlier when we had our budgeting sessions going through early this year, you know, we saw we did have a few cuts here and there. We were trying to get position. We're just being cautious. Uh, we're confident that's going to be on the upswing again, but that does grab our attention a little bit. We definitely want those to be positive numbers. So that, again, is the revenue for those three major funds. Now, if you look at the expenditures for those three major funds combined, again, that bounces around a little bit more when you put them all three together. But look, this is what our expenditures are growing at. A little over 7% in the blue, a little over 4% in the green, and just barely negative in the yellow. But the thing you learn from looking at these two charts is from 2013 to 2017, it was a negative, four point, a negative 0 0.24% for our revenue. It was a negative 0.02% for our expenditures. So again, we want those numbers to be flipped around a little bit. They're so close, not a huge margin of error. But again, it's the trend that we're watching. We think it's temporary. We're just keeping an eye on it. Now, this is a busy chart. This chart is a combination of the first two we just had. So this has both the revenues and the expenditures for those three funds combined. And what you're going to see there is now you start to see where they start bouncing around. We have some years where we have more revenue than expenses. We have some years we have more expenses than revenue. Again, if we have excess revenue, it goes into reserves. If we have excess expenses or don't have enough revenue to cover our expenses, we'll go dip into reserves for that. That's normal operating. Not something we want to do heavily, but that does get balanced out from time to time. When we budget, we always budget that they match up. We think we're going to bring in this much and we're going to spend that much. That always matches when we start the year. It never matches at the end of the year. But we look at these. There's some things where, you know, look at this year in 2006 where you get a big spike in revenue. What those spikes typically mean is we probably refinanced some debt. We maybe had some debt for some other infrastructure projects. When we refinance that debt, we get all the money back in again, and it comes in as revenue. So if we refinance a million dollars, we get a million dollars of revenue or whatever the balance is left, and then we spread that out over time in expenses. So those spikes are a little bit misleading. But again, there's times also where you see the expenses are a little more. Maybe we had a project that wasn't budgeted for. And we had to get that project done now. It was an emergency. We had to do it. We had to dip in reserves to do that. Reserves have come up a couple times. We're not going to talk about that, but we typically keep about four months in our reserve funds. That's a conservative way to do that. Glenn touched upon some of that earlier. Uh, we've always done a good job of that with the city, of keeping our reserves where they should be. So, again, we're in good financial shape. The trends are trending a little bit the way we don't want them to. We're just keeping a close eye on it. So, to go back to our challenge, oops, I'm going to turn it back over to the mayor. Those doggone taxes are so unpredictable. <laughs> That's our challenge, and not much we can do about it, but live with it. Do the best to try to budget around it. And our expenses, some of them are compounding, so we need to pay close attention to that. And the current trend where some of our expenses are growing faster than our revenues, that's something we really watch like a hawk because we don't want those two lines to intersect. So what can we do about that? We're fortunate that we're in a good situation now. The city is healthy. We're economically sound. Our fund balances are strong we're not exceeding or even coming close to our debt capacity. And sales taxes this year are looking really good. And I can say uh, we expect to get, if you take what we did last year in those last couple months and add it to what we've done this year so far, we should come out about $15,900,000, which is about 3.2% better than 2017. So that's a good thing. On the average over the last five years, we've been growing at slightly under 2%. So 3.2% is good. We like that. So when we're budgeting, 
we always try to be conservative and that way we're safe. But even when we budget conservatively, there are times when our revenues are less than our expenses and we might have to make some adjustments. So we've, we've done that. We had to do that this last budget year just to make everything balance. Um, and it's normal to have to do that. If you're not doing that, you run out of reserves. And so we're not gonna run out of reserves. So what I'd really rather do than cut expenditures is increase our revenues. So the city's been working very closely with the Watertown Development Company, with the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and with the Chamber of Commerce to look for ways to increase our revenues. And we're putting a lot of energy and effort into doing that, and we have been. I mean, the amenities that we have in our community, like the new wellness center, for instance, that is helping us to generate revenue. And we need to keep looking for those things. The vision, um, vision H2020 that we did in 2012, that was a fantastic tool for us to do. The community came out, said what it wanted, and we've been picking off those items one by one through time, and we're seeing a good result because of it. So there's one thing I want to point out. I don't know if you've walked through the hallway coming into the finance department. There's a whole bunch of certificates on the wall. Our finance office this last year received the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association. And what that signifies is that our finance report goes above and beyond what it has to. Transparency is very important to us, so we don't just report the bare minimum, we report a lot more. And it, it's the whole city, including municipal utilities, we're doing a good job of reporting what we need to report plus more. And actually last year, only four municipalities got that award. It's not like everybody gets it. And in fact, for the last 35 years, we've gotten that award every single year. So that should give you some confidence in our city finance department and staff and the municipal utilities. They've done a great job. They're very, very careful. And, um, it, but it isn't just them. It's the, all the city departments as well. And oh, I have to say, the departments do have to obey the finance officer. <laughs> she rules with an iron fist. But um, because of that, we're, we're in good shape. And um, this thanks to all the city employees for that. And things are great in Watertown. It's uh, really a good place for us to be. And I'm actually very excited about some of the things that are developing and our potential for growth is great. And I think we're gonna see it in the next few years. So things are really good. And I thank you all for coming. And as we promised, we have time now for questions. So who would like to start? We do have a microphone here. So, um, can either come up and I'll hand you this one or come to the podium. Liam. Does the decrease in the, I'm trying to figure out how best to word this. The trend that we're seeing in terms of a uh, decreased percentage of an increase, is that something that's happening statewide or even nationwide or is that somehow unique to Watertown? What do we know about other municipalities? Does that reflect something that's going on statewide who wants to take that Kristen <laughs> I guess I can't really speak to exactly so I'll go with that but um I think every community at some point sees that and I think that it's very common um, sales tax is one of those things where when people feel comfortable they spend and when they don't feel comfortable, they don't spend. So can I say that everybody's feeling it? I don't know. Um, I guess with this rep this presentation, what we were looking for is to just show you what we're finding in Watertown and what we as the council, the mayor, and myself feel is important to, to point out as to what we're seeing happen. So maybe Don wants to. I would just add from a national standpoint, if you go back to 08 when the recession hit, you saw a lot of cities, states, other municipalities, other parts of the country really take a big hit. And we, we went through that in pretty good shape. We took a dip, recovered very, very quickly. The Midwest overall did. 
And the other part I would add to it, though, is we're, we're very egg tied. So as egg goes, we typically go, and egg's having a tough go of it right now. So you look at our sales tax revenue this year, considering that egg's having a tougher time, actually, that's probably pretty good news here. We're going to probably get a 3.3% increase this year. Maybe just to echo on top of that, Don, we had this conversation as well. Many of the um, communities that are what I would call economic centers for the regions, um, they're all tied to a specific geographic trade area. And if you're finding population decreases in your geographic trade area, those people all come to the central hubs for most of their shopping. And so while in our geographic trade area hasn't grown, hasn't shrunk, we have been seeing a population decrease in our area. It ha it's not to the same extent that you would say in the James River Valley, in the Aberdeen Center, or down in Huron in some of those areas. And so when you have c communities not generating as much sales tax, they are forced into generating more property tax to offset some of those losses to make their budgets. To take that just a step further, uh, I came from a community before I moved back in 03, it was a suburb of Minneapolis, brand new uh, suburb, very little industry. What do you think happened to their property taxes? Because they had to build schools for all these people moving in with kids. So their property taxes were going up. We have the benefit of having a pretty strong industrial base, pretty good retail sector. We, were, we service an area of about 100,000 people, and we're able to spread that out amongst those different tax sources. I think it's really important to point out how shopping locally really affects us it, it has a huge impact on us so um, we need to make sure that we're doing that ourselves and looking for opportunities to grow that in any way that we can and the early planning that was done in this community with our municipal utilities being separate but part of our organization a separate board um, that was really, really smart. And having a Watertown development company since 1940 or something like that, we have aggressively gone after industrial base, and we have it here. And that's enabled us to weather the bumps. So that's good. We're, we're fortunate because of that. Other questions? the other revenues they talk about about a 15 percent remaining what are those other revenues okay so when we looked at the capital improvement fund on average about 84 percent of that was from the sales tax the other things that go into the capital improvement fund a lot of it is the interest um, just because it does hold such a strong cash balance in it and the other part that goes into that is a lot of the STP funds that help to that's a state I should kind of clarify that um, we call it intergovernmental. Anything that we receive from the federal or state government is called intergovernmental revenue, and that is the, what makes up the difference of that. If I could chime into that, uh, the point was made that we don't commingle the, the, the capital improvement fund with the general fund. Some cities do that. We don't. Um, we've been very consistent about that. If you look at our capital improvement fund, there are times we've used debt to supplement that, and the Wellness Center is a good example, but there's also times we've used that capital improvement fund to build a facility, and a good example is our police department. We're building that fund up as we move forward. When that, when that uh, building was put together and built, we paid for that. We were saving for that in advance. It's, it's like we're getting ahead of the game because we know the expense is coming, so hats off to the city for doing that, and that's true with the fire department as well. So uh, our capital improvement fund, there, there is a little bit of a challenge we do have, though. When we build a new building, we use capital dollars to do that. Then we pick that, the ongoing expense, and we hand that over to the general fund. So what are we, we've been building a lot of things, and we're just making sure we're able to answer those three questions. A, do we need it? B, can we afford to build it? And C, can we afford to operate it? Because that third one is usually the big question. I would like to add, too, that as we build these new facilities like the softball complex and tournaments come here and we used capital improvement funds to build those but then the people that come here and spend money a lot of that goes back into that BBB tax which is 
uh, set by state law how we can use that BBB money, and we don't do it differently than the state law. Um, we could restrict it further if we wanted to, but, but we spend it just like the state law allows, which is for promoting the city and for recreation. And so that fund is there to help us do that, and, and it does help us uh, restock our coffers. Other questions? Uh, Mark, you had one. Mayor, have you been able to model the internet sales tax increase that the state's been saying is about a $55 million increase? I should let Kristen answer that, but we, as far as I know, we, we are told by the state what we get, and I don't know that they break it out. I get to play the unknown card again. Um, I think that's a tough one. I think everybody likes to think it's gonna have a huge increase, um, but I don't know if anybody's really comfortable saying what it is until we, until we see. It's, it's a big unknown because it hasn't really been monitored up until now. So I think with that, I have to say it's an unknown. I'm hopeful that it's really high, but I think it's unknown. Kristen, when is when is that supposed to be coming to the municipalities? That sales tax. I think it takes effect November first. I think so. Would that be a monthly, a quarterly. Uh, monthly? It should be monthly, yeah. So we should know in the next month or so. Yeah, it's usually about two months behind. Okay. Don, I'm just curious how our 40 percent debt service ranks with other communities as far as our commitments to our liabilities on a monthly basis <laughs> yeah as far as how it ranks there again this presentation wasn't really designed to compare ourselves um there's so many communities that do things so much differently than we do what we wanted to do was just to break down how the city of Watertown is doing. As far as the 40%, I feel that it's it's a very comfortable spot that we're in. At 40%, I don't feel like, um, as the mayor stated, we have plenty of debt capacity. As far as 2018, we could still legally go to 47 more million dollars now. Would I feel comfortable with that? No. But where we're sitting right now as far as paying the principal and interest back, I think the 40% is, is accurate. The other thing is, um, Councilman Roby mentioned, we do restrict our capital improvement fund for simply infrastructure. So to me, that's what it was designed for. It was designed to take on that debt when we have these big projects that we want to do. So as far as is it in line with others, I can't say, it, but I think for Watertown, I think it's a comfort, it's a comfortable place to be. Just to add that I see Rick Hohn sitting here in the audience here, but we just built a brand new middle school here in Watertown. And they have the same discipline with their capital fund uh, at the school district as we do here in the city. So when we built that new school, your property taxes didn't go up because they had been planning for that in the way they have revenues, expenditures, and savings and, and, and such. So there's another example where planning for that, it's nice that when that planning's done and those capital dollars are kept for their specified purpose because if you flip that over if we were dipping into our capital improvement fund every year and then all of a sudden something comes up but we have to build something and it maybe sooner than we expected we might have not have the money to do it and then have to borrow a lot more money to get that done and when that happens then you're at the, the mercy of what are interest rates at that time and then you're looking at maybe do we have to get tighten things up elsewhere in the in sense of borrowing, though, we did borrow and, and bond out for the wellness center, which, by the way, is bringing in more revenue than, than we're having on expenditures, which is great news. And it's also bringing people to town. But uh, with the wellness center and such, you know, we are well within our capacity on that. We also borrowed at very low interest rates in that. So the timing of that worked out very well for the city. In regards to the sales tax, is there is there any concern uh, with some of the retailers that are leaving town as a, as a trend? I mean, is that a concern to, to revenue generated on that side? And if so, what are we, you know, what can we do to, to kind of make up for those small percentages possibly? 
I'll answer that. It is a great concern to everyone. I mean, it's a it's inconvenient for those of us who live here and want to be able to shop here, uh, but it 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 is um, affecting our revenue. We, we can't deny that. Other things may be making up for it, but we can't deny that we're probably losing out because of that. And the city's working very hard and has been. I mean, we've hired the best company in the nation to help us with our retail development here. And uh, actually, we're working on it internally as well. And I've been partnering with the Watertown Development Company, the Chamber of Commerce, Convention Visitors Bureau. We're all working together and trying to come up with plans and problems. It takes time. It, it takes time, and people are not building brick and mortar stores right now. They're in the process of closing them all over the country. So it isn't just Watertown, it's all over that we're seeing those trends. And we're trying to stay on top of it. So yes, it's a, it's a very big concern for us. You wanna add? Other questions? He's asked if how much of the jump in the BBB tax is due to the wellness center, and I think it. I don't think we can deny that that's helped, but to measure it is, uh, it yeah, that's hard. To keep Watertown to keep Watertown on the map, so. I, th I think what I said was uh, uh, some of that additional BBB tax uh, revenue that's come in can be attributed to the, the, f the philosophical changes that the CVB has undergone in the last few years. Um, getting out there traveling to some of these national shows and, and making sure that the awareness for the amenities that our community has are known to those people so that we can bring these tournaments in. So. So when the CVB is really, you know, actively working, a lot of times it's outside of our community to try and bring those people into our community. And I think I alluded to this earlier, but they're doing a lot of things with social media, very data-driven decisions where they're getting very specific on who they go after and how they go after them. And I think that we're starting to see the fruits of that effort. I agree. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? Councilman Danforth? Matt, Matt, you won the bet. Um, Kristen, we talked about the 40% in, in our debt uh, capacity that we're paying out now. Um, we do have a payoff that'll be coming within the next, what, four or five years, I believe it is, mm -hmm. that will pay off the debt for the uh, event center. Is that correct? Yes. I believe it's five years, four years? Yeah, I think it's 2022. No, oh, that's math, but um, <laughs> four. So that number will reduce our, and that percentage, that 40% down by whatever we're paying out of there now then, yep. correct? Yep. Okay. Any idea what that number is that we're paying annually now? I'd, I'd have to look at, it's around the 400. I think it's between four and 500,000, I think. Yep. Yeah. So that number will come off of that 40%, so. Do we have any way of analyzing uh, uh, areas or regions of town or, or industrial parks or whatever it is? Do we have any way to analyze uh, revenue generation versus expenditures? Or does that factor in, especially when we're thinking about increasing or trying to strategize to increase sales tax revenue generation? I mean, how do we target areas? What's the low-hanging fruit, the, the low-cost, high-return areas? There are ways to do that, and uh, we've been thinking about going about a study such as you describe, where we can't get specific numbers from the Department of Revenue. They won't tell us what any one business um, generates in revenue, but they will tell us a group, and if we give them a list of businesses 
they will tell us the revenue generation. And we could do that in, in various different sectors of our town and compare it to you know, what the infrastructure costs are, what the tax generation is from property tax. We can add all that together to see what the bang for the buck is, so to speak. I mean, when you have a concentrated central business district where you have um, all of the land is utilized for buildings outside of the right-of-way, in other words, parking is um, not provided on private property, but within public property. Um, it's highly concentrated buildings and usually several stories up. Um, there, that's usually intensely uh, revenue rich. And um, in Watertown, that's our central business district. We, I would like to see those graphs for our downtown. I've seen them for other towns. Um, and, and you usually see where you have more concentrated buildings with, uh, without the giant parking lots. You see most of the land is actively being used to generate revenue, and so the, the revenue per square foot is very high compared to the box stores where there's giant parking lots and half or more of their land is used for parking, which generates no revenue, and then a one-story building. And so that's a very strategic way of um, looking at a community for um, places where you can get the most bang for the buck. And, and if you look around, and I've seen these charts on many, many different communities, because I'm interested in this kind of stuff, downtowns are really worth the investment because they are rich in intense development and revenue generating pockets versus what we have to pay, the limited amount that we pay to maintain roads to them. They're all sharing the roads. And so that's a generally a good place. You get a, a good return on your investment. And it's you know old buildings generally in anybody's downtown. Those are the first parts of the communities that developed and so the buildings are very old and they, they're the heart of almost any community. But the investment that you make there pays off quickly. And so that's part of the reason that I think it's really important that we focus on our downtown. Um, not only is it the heart of our community, but we do get more bang for the buck. We don't have a two mile stretch of road with three or four box stores on it, which you know, if we follow some of their standard operating procedure, they'll be there 15 years or 20 years, and then they'll abandon the building. We'll still have to maintain that road, and that road only leads to them in some cases. So, uh, you know, this is urban planning, what Liam's talking about. Other questions or comments? I don't see any. Well, again, I want to thank everybody for coming out of your warm, cozy house to listen to us talk about tax revenue. Really appreciate it. So thank you. We have some business to finish up here. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Is there any old business? Seeing none, is there any new business? No new business? Are there any liaison member reports? 
None. We have no reason to go into executive session pursuant to SDCL 1-25-2, so I'll look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. So moved by Y, second by Lalum. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries.